Hi guys, thank you very much for joining us. I am uh, Zella Chen. I'm the Hong Kong-based member of the Asian American Journalists Association. We're sorry we were experiencing technical difficulties there, but hopefully we have everything under control now. And um, so for today, I'm hosting the panel on the Occupy Hong Kong movement. It's been almost a month now, and protesters have taken to the streets and paralyzed parts of Hong Kong, demanding free elections in 2017. Now, joining me are journalists who have been covering the situation on the ground. We have Eric Mack. He's a producer-presenter for the affairs section of Radio Television Hong Kong. Um, Shirley Yam couldn't join us, but we have Zoe Hung, an executive committee member of the Hong Kong Journalists Association here instead. Now, I I'm going to um, start off with uh, Eric. Um, some of this coverage has gotten a bit violent, and you were out there in Mong Kok, which is probably one of the more um, violent protest sites out in Hong Kong, and you were injured. What were you doing there, and how did that happen? Well, on that day, I was filming in Mong Kok, and I just got down to some kind of uh, uh, some zones of confrontation. Actually, there was not confrontation. I mean, there are two sides of people. One side, they are the protesters, and there are, I mean, many of them, the protesters, they stand still, and they are just um, uh, looking at the other side. I mean, at the other side, there are about 10 people. They kept on shouting at the protesters and with uh, violent words, and even some of them provoked or, uh, as, well, even some of them uh, were saying some provocative words, like, okay, come out and hit me. They, they kept on uh, shouting at the protesters like that. And I was filming there, and I was trying to capture all these uh, incidents. And then I, when I try to get close up of those who are shouted, or, or who are doing the shouting, I mean, when I got close ups of them, some of them just didn't want me to to shoot them, so they they said, oh, I don't want to be uh, videoed, so they just said they just refused to appear in my camera. But one, one of them, one of them that is the one who hit me, well, when I tried to get close up of him, he reduced and he tried to shake off my camera. And that's the first thing. And then I said, well, I was a reporter and you shouldn't inhibit my work. I told him and then he, the next thing he did is he punched me at the face and, and yeah, that's what happened. And then I, and people uh, drag him, drag him away, and try to save him from me. And when I get back my glove, I, I mean, I put right back my glasses, and I try to get my camera ready again. And then I hit him again, and I ask him, "Well, why did you hit me?" And then this time he got really furious, and he came up and hit me again with, well. He punches several punches, and this time I was injured, and yeah, got bleeding. But that's what happened. And then you went to the hospital afterwards, right? Yeah, I reported it to the police first after some uh, first aid treatment, and then well, after taking a statement in the police station, then I was sent to the hospital for examination. Now, um, Zoe, you, you're the Hong Kong Journalists Association has been monitoring these attacks on journalists. Mm -hmm. How common have attacks on journalists been in these protests compared with other protests? I think the, it, is, um, it is quite extraordinary and it is, the, the situation is very bad because we receive uh, reports that uh, journalists get hit in beaten by the police or by the demonstrators. It is very rare and it has never happened in Hong Kong in, in, in I mean, in decades. But um, we see that um, in every day when the, uh, when the, um, 
temperature of the demonstration rises and we see um, police and the uh, protester are uh, having a very bad uh, emotion and then they have they were angry with the uh, reporters so we see many assertion with, uh, against the reporters and uh, we received at least uh, 13 cases um, um, in these few days but we haven't gotten uh, most update data but um, in uh, one day, one night, uh, I mean in the 15th of October, we have got 11 cases reported. So uh, we have got um, three cases uh, reported. And starting from uh, 28th of September to yesterday, we have 14 cases. Now, um, Zoe with the um, Hong Kong Journalists Association, who are uh, most, who's attacking these journalists? Um, one is the um, uh, police, and the other is the anti-democratic uh, camps. The, uh, the protesters, they are trying to just like Eric. Uh, uh, they, they would um, insult or try to attack the uh, reporters. OK. Um, so. What do you guys think could be done to better protect journalists in the future? Who can protect journalists if the police are hating the, uh, the, the reporter? Who can protect us? And I think the important thing is that we recognize that these things are not tolerable in Hong Kong. I mean, the police, if they do what they should do. I mean, well, of course, in cases of confrontations or, I mean, when the environment is chaotic, they may not be able to stop the, the violence from happening at once. But even when it, well, I mean, once it happened, they should catch the suspects or they should catch the attackers. They should do, take legal actions. They should charge all those attackers so that they will know the consequences of attacking, not just reporters, but I mean the consequences of violence, so that they, it will stop them from doing. It will have a preventive effect. I mean, if they know, oh, after hitting the reporters, they can just get away, or after hitting citizens, they can just get away, then they will be encouraged to do so, because there will be no consequences. So I mean, the important thing is that the police have to do what they should do, but I mean these days, for whatever reasons, they seem not to be doing as much as they should and they can. So it might send a wrong message to people that well these things can be tolerated, and it may encourage those people to do these violent acts. So Eric, what are you going to do in your case? How are you going to follow up with that? Well, I mean, I'm the fortunate one because uh, the whole process of me being attacked is captured by different stations. Video, I mean, uh, if there are videos available online. I mean, from TV station, from newspapers, they capture the whole process. So this time, the police, um, I, I called the police uh, about a week after the incident and to know the progress of my case. And they said, well, investigation is ongoing. And well, they will gather, they are gathering evidence and try to, well, so investigation is still ongoing. But I think in my case, because it's, the evidences are all there and the, the police can't just say, oh, we don't got enough evidence and so just leave the suspect away. But I mean, in other cases or in the cases in the past, the police sometimes will say, well, we don't have enough evidence, so they can't go on with the prosecution. So, I mean, well, if for me, the, I am the lucky one, but I hope the other are also the lucky ones. But. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, we have on the line Eric Mack. 
who is a producer presenter with Radio Television Hong Kong, and um, Zoe Hung with the Hong Kong Journalists Association. Um, Zoe, can you put this in context for us? I mean, Eric just talked about his experience um, covering the protests right now, and you've been covering protests for 10 years in Hong Kong. Are these really more violent than the other ones have been? Yes, I think so. Well, I think the nature of the demonstration is quite different because uh, in the past there will be large rallies or demonstrations, large scale, but uh, the time span is very short, like one day or two days. But uh, for this time, it was today is 20 days, almost 20 days. So um, the the intensity of the um, of the whole situation is, uh, you know, the um, the heat and the emotional um, and the psychological state of of all the party are not as stable as it was um, that we've seen uh, before. So we see that there are many, many, um, many violence happened towards the demonstrator and towards the uh, journalist. And uh, we would let's be fair to the police that uh, if there is no police action, I mean, when the police are just standing and, and doing preparation and watching, I think the reporters and the policemen can have very good contact, uh, conversation and relations. But if there is any action against the uh, demonstrator, we see that uh, the, the pro-democratic demonstrators, we see that uh, the police do not um, apply the, uh, um, the guidance that the police should cooperate with the uh, journalists. Sometimes the journalists are got beaten by the baton and some are attacked by pepper, pepper sprays and some was just dragged away from where they were standing. So um, the safety of the uh, reporters are not concerned at for, of the police. So that's what concerns us. And we have um, uh, the uh, Journalist Association uh, together with other unions. We have um, uh, put on a statement to protest about uh, the, um, the attitudes of the police against the uh, reporters. Zoe, I wanted to ask you about the use of tear gas mm -hmm. in the protest. I mean, that's been quite unusual. It hasn't been used since 2005. Mm -hmm. What has journalists' response been to that? Uh, it, was, it caught the Hong Kong society with surprise that uh, we, have, we haven't imagined in the 28th of December the police will use uh, tear gas against the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the protester when they were very peaceful and just standing um, uh, in the row. So uh, many of the reporters and the, uh, and, the and the protester, they do not have Googles and they do not have things to protect themselves. And it is very weird because in uh, 2005, the police used it uh, to get against the um, WTO protester. They are from the um, Korea, and they have been um, said by the police that uh, described by the police that they are violent um, protester, and they are very professional. Uh, protester and they were kept and they were uh, the police used the tear gas but this time in nine years past that has uh, never been used before uh, 2005 uh, there has no tear gas I mean almost no tear gas used as uh, this scale against Hong Kong people and um, so it caught us by surprise we didn't know why uh, the police uh, judgment that um, judged that they would use uh, almost 90, uh, 87 tear gas. Um, it is very weird. Yeah. Well, why don't we talk about what protective measures um, companies have been doing for their journalists? Like we see out there that the protesters have their umbrellas or face masks.
contact against um, tear gas and pepper spray. And then on the police side, they're wearing their helmets and riot gear and, and their shields. What are um, journalists wearing? What sort of safety measures do they have? Um, the journalists have very minimal uh, uh, measure, like uh, totally unprotective rugos and a very uh, basic mask. And maybe they have Hamlet, but um, most of them they use their own Hamlet, so it is not exactly provided by the company. So, Eric, um, what are you doing? You're out in the field. Well, for us, I mean, our station provided this, provided us with Hamlet. Well, well, you know, for I mean, in the first few days when the the situation is not that uh, bad. I mean, we, we. I mean, you know, when you wear the helmet, it actually inhibits your work in some way. So when the situation was not that bad, we won't. I mean, we wouldn't put that more on. But we have our mask. I mean, those. I mean, after when the first tear gas bomb was used, I mean, we know that we need that. We have the. We have a better mask that can well provide more uh, protection than the usually facial mask. I mean, and then we have goggles, but you know, well, the goggles, because I, on the 28th of September, I worked uh, in Amruti with my partner. So we, we, we experienced, we, we experienced here guys again at midnight, you know, when people were just standing no more violence because they, people were, were tired at that time and they were just standing completely no violent actions and then tear gas were used again so even my partner and myself were uh, well facing the tear gas and my partner were even with her goggles she got very uncomfortable I mean tears I mean really her eyes really hurt and she coughed a lot and yeah I mean with even with such protection I mean you, you still have some kind of bad impacts on you and so, well, I mean, yeah, the protection is that we, we should ask, I mean, the protection, I mean, we, we shouldn't have protection against weapons. I mean, we should ask why these weapons were used. If they were not used, we don't need such protection. I mean, these weapons should be used only when they are necessary, but are they in this case? Okay. Um. I guess let's play devil's advocate a little bit and say the police are actually under a lot of stress out there, right, being on the front lines of this. And maybe that is why um, they are being a little bit more violent now. What do you guys think to that? I think everybody is under pressure at this time, and everybody are very tired. And some of our colleagues have been in the street for 20 days and even they have uh, their day off they just go off to the streets and go go into the scene so everybody is very tired but nobody is entitled to hit or use uh, over use of force to do their job okay. I'm sorry to be fair to the police, I mean, I understand this stress because I'm, I was, I, I am, and I was in the front line. I mean, I faced the police very often, and I know they got a lot of, I mean, bad words from the protesters. Some of the more vigorous protesters, they shouted at the police. I mean, they used very bad words or even foul language against them. But having said that, I should say, well, the ones to be accused of is. Well, why the arrangements or strategic plans, I mean, the strategies of the police, the planners, I mean, the management of the police, why they have such arrangements of forces, why they have to put the police in such position, they, this, these are questions to be asked. I mean, they are under stress because they are put in such position, they are being deployed under such strategies. I mean, these, are these strategies uh, correct or, uh, I mean, are they useful? I mean, I, are they the appropriate strategy to be adopted? I mean, these are the questions to be asked. I mean, 
they are under stress, but I mean there is a limit and they have guidelines to what they should do and how, uh, I mean, how weapons or how violence can be uh, uh, used. I mean, how the degree of force can be used. Okay, for those of you who are just joining us, we are having a uh, panel discussion on the Occupy Hong Kong movement, and with us we have Eric Mack, who is a producer-presenter of the Current Affairs section at Radio Television Hong Kong, and we have Zoe Hung. She is the executive committee member of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. Now, I'm um, curious to see and to hear from you guys, what sort of uh, guidance has your companies given in terms of how the story should be covered? All right. Well, I think well, we don't have a special guidance on the incidents. I mean, we just use our, I mean, the principles or the elements of journalism. I mean, it's usually used. I mean, we have to be, we have to stay impartial to in our reports or even in our features, we can't be inclined to only one side. I mean, we may have our viewpoints in our stories, but we still we have to uh, let the other for I mean, let the other side at least can when there is some kind of accusation or when we try to make a statement, make a make a viewpoint on one side, we have to at least let the other side respond to such accusation. So I mean, that's, that's impartiality. The elements or the principle of impartiality is the prime rule in this case. I mean, we, we still observe this rule in our report on this incident. Yes, I think uh, reporters have their own views and they have been very tired and they have been very moved, deeply moved by the situation. They will have some thoughts about the democratic movement and the anti-democratic movement. But I see that if you see from the SEMP, the RTHK, the main power, and um, I mean the main newspaper and new, uh, TV news, we see that their reports have been very fair. Sometimes we, as um, outsider, we say, "Oh, this is too flat." Why don't you have more punchlines? And why don't you have more comments? But um, they have been um, very prudent on this issue. Because I, I think everybody knows that we are very important in the issue. We do not want to stir up uh, unnecessary emotion uh, towards somebody. And also, we receive many, many rumors that we see rumors from the WhatsApp, from the Facebook, but um, I, I see that journalists have been very working very hard to make some uh, proof what is happening. Is this rumor real or what is uh, happening behind this rumor? I think we are doing a, a appropriate job uh, of this situation. There have been a lot of rumors um, going around on social media, and that's where a lot of this information comes first, right? The first sources of information is on Twitter or Facebook or other um, social media outlets. Um, Eric, since you're in the field, how do you incorporate that into your workflow? I mean, how do you, do you, how do you separate the fact from the fiction, and how do you use that in your final product? I mean, for me, is uh, we have we are in a better position because I work for a weekly program, but not daily news or instant news. So when we receive some news or I mean some information, some sources of information or or even rumors, we have time to verify whether they are real, whether they are correct. I mean or even when there is accusation against the other side or against some persons or some parties, we can try to ask those people or those parties to respond to such charge or such accusation so as to verify or let them to have their response. I mean, that's, uh, so we are in a better position. So in our final product, we would have the 
we will have the, I mean, the charges or the accusations, and then we may have the other side responding. Well, the, I mean, the the audience can judge whether you believe in which side. I mean, it because in these days there are some, usually there are some conflicts. I mean, in the what really happened. For one side, they will say, "Well, you use violence against me," for example, and for the other side, they will say, "Oh, you start the big." The, you start the chaos first, and so we can have both voices from both sides, and we can have more verification work. Yeah, I think the journalists have uh, understand their stand and understand their importance. So I see people discussing uh, the reporter discussing this rumor in the WhatsApps, and everybody is trying to ask uh, where these rumors come from, and I. Must admit that in the first few days, I mean two days at least, um, some rumor cannot be proved. So we see that in the in the mass media, um, we do not report that rumor. So the um, the social media goes ahead and uh, violently, and um, people will accuse that. Oh, why didn't reporter do their job? And I think we do because we did our job. That's why we didn't report that rumor. Well, okay. uh, yeah. To add a point, because yeah, I agree that in these days, I mean, we receive particularly much more sources of information than than we usually have. So the first question we ask is always when when some source say, oh, "Okay, uh, uh, person A says this," and then the first thing we say. Did he really say that? So we will try. If we can, we will ask person A directly. Every time, because in the past, when we received yeah. some sources of information, that's usually we we may tend to believe it. But in these days, the first question we ask must be: Did he really say that, or did this really happen? That's the first question in these days. Yes, because too many people are asking A. So A may not be able to answer all the quest, all the calls. So so that's the that's the difficulty. Okay, great. So um, for those of you who are just joining us, we have um, Eric Mack, who is a producer presenter with um, radio television in Hong Kong, and we have Zoe Hung. She is. Um, with the executive committee on the Hong Kong Journalists Association and we are just talking about social media and the use of social media in um, our work right now covering the Hong Kong protest. Now are there particular sources on social media that you like? That you feel is fair and balanced and you always go to for more information? Well. For the use of social media, I think in these days, I mean, we use it as some kind of uh, sources to because we work for TV, so when we we have to go there to to film it down to have videos before anything can be watched by audience. So because on social media, there are many Facebook pages. Uh, announcing, okay, this something something happened here or something happened there at that spot. So and then reporters showing seeing that that particular line of or some that news feed, and then we rush to there and to see how oh, is that did it happen? I uh, will try to film it down. So I mean, this is our sources of information, and then we can rush to the spot and and to get videos for for what what whatever is going on. So but. For reporting, we we don't normally rely on those information or those sources mm -hmm. from Facebook or other social media. Yes, I, I agree. I think reporters are there are there are a whole team of reporter on site of the different sites in the streets. So if there is uh, any uh, any piece of information flowing from the social media, I think the newsroom is the first thing is to. Um, Get a reporter on scene to see is this really happening? Because we have seen rumors, we have seen ridiculous rumors. So uh, we have to go and see and check. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to ask you a question about um, 
the social media aspect of this. I mean, the protesters are of that generation that's very social media savvy. Do you think that um, they might be manipulating the media coverage in a way? I think um, there is a um, good percentage of um, coverage of what the social media want, uh, what the netizen want uh, from the social media. From uh, so the uh, the newspaper will have columns um, on this kind of um, information. They may be uh, very entertaining, there may be artworks, and there may be comments and commentaries from the uh, social media. It is, um, it is a good way to show the uh, dynamic of the society. But um, that's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, I think the reporters are under very large pressure uh, by the social media because people may not like what you reported. Uh, both the pro-democratic uh, camp and the other side, and the police and the government and your source. So we have to we have to be very careful. Uh, although we will receive these kind of messages criticizing you, and you must know what is happening and what what where you stand. Uh, that is very important. Yeah, I okay. think. Uh, I think um, well, they are driving the well because for us, I mean, I'm working for a program on a new channel. I mean, we we have to struggle. I mean, for the younger generation, the more internet related or social media related generations, they will expect more from your program. But for traditional viewers who receive information primarily on TV or on newspapers, they get. I mean, they see Hong Kong. I mean, or the movements, the umbrella movement. From, I mean, they have a very different perceptions of the whole movement. So I mean, we have to strike a delicate balance between the two. To I mean, as a TV program, you have to respond to the traditional audience and as well as the audience who wants more from your reporting or from your feature stories. So I mean, for, with some stories, we will be more plain with more basic information or explanatory. And for uh, some feature stories, we will go more in depth or with some kind of, well, with fits with the taste of the netizens more. Yeah, I know that some uh, media have received a lot of complaints. From the from the Facebook, from the netizen, and also from the uh, anti-democratic oh no anti-occupy uh, movement camp. Uh, there are telephone calls and emails and Facebook replies uh, towards the uh, newspaper uh, uh, the news organization. I think the RTHK has received a lot of call from the elderly uh, who complained of about how they cover the uh, situation and so I think we're under pressure, uh, more pressure because there are more channels to complain. Okay, thank you. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, we have um, Eric Mack here. He's a producer presenter for RTHK, and we have Zoe Hung. She's on the executive committee with the Hong Kong Journalists Association. So I wanted to get into the fact that the local media, really, for a month now, we've been providing rolling coverage on these protests every single day, overnight as well. Do you think they're fanning the flame? getting people all worked up to go out and protest some more, or the camps that come out to protest against the pro-democracy protesters? Mm -hmm. I think the, you mean, your question is whether the media have uh, contributed to the, uh, to the demonstration, right? Yes, are we feeding it? Well, I have to say, well, that's always what the media do. Well, that is to report what's happening. I mean, will it add to the temperature or add to the heat of the 
protests or the movement, I think. But this time, not the media, but this time the social media or mm -hmm. the network. I mean, the, the, the tradition. I mean, in the past, the media can to have a great effect in steering up the movements or, uh, I mean, to provide temperature for the movement. But this time, I think the temperature remains more to the social media. I mean, even when uh, suddenly, for, for example, when violence or the clearance happened on on this day, and the next day, the reoccupy movement come up. I mean, the crowds gather again. I mean, these are all mobilized by social media instead of traditional media. I mean, the speed. I mean, for traditional media, the speed cannot be so quickly, or the, they cannot react such with oh, really? such. So we just well, oh. we we just help with. I mean, we just go on, or we just push by the movement instead of. Uh, pushing the movement. But I think if there is some uh, very extreme incident happened, like uh, the day of the tear gas and the day the TVB uh, have a video that a uh, policeman beaten up a uh, protester, I think this incident, this video, when they uh, get in on air, especially for the uh, three channels, I think they will call up people to um, to uh, to go to join the protest or have a different view of the protest. Okay, for those of you who are just joining us, we have um, Eric Mack. He's with RTHK. Zoe Hung. She's on the executive committee of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. And um, we get to welcome Leon Lee. Lee. He is with the South China Morning Post, which is an English language newspaper here in Hong Kong. Now, he actually works for the Young Post section, which is an online and print publication geared towards high school students. He manages um, a team of reporters who usually write about feature stories and um, stories that teach students how to learn English. Now, very recently, his team has turned into a breaking news coverage team with reporters on every hotspot in the city. Now, how did that happen? Hey, uh, first of all, sorry, guys, for being late. Um, it just happened because, um, so the whole thing started um, on September 22nd as the university boycott. And since, like you essentially mentioned, we're a high school, uh, your product for high school students, you know, we decided to go out and cover that. And then by Friday, it turned into the secondary school students joined. So we definitely had to cover that. And then, but then, and then, like we were, we left. We weren't there when they charged into uh, Civic Square. But then it basically, and, and then it evolved into the Occupy Central. So we started covering, it and we just had to keep on going. You know, we need to give our readers, you know, what they want to know. So how do you actually do this? I mean, I've been out on the sites, and the internet connection is terrible, actually. <laughs> I mean, you guys are blogging, you're, you're tweeting, you're, you know, you have all this going on. How do you guys actually make that happen? Um, WhatsApp is our best friend, you know, because, uh, like, what we do is we basically send a couple of reporters out, maybe two or three onto the field, and we have this WhatsApp group. Um, they basically send their photos and send their updates via that WhatsApp group to two, or two, or, or two, like, two more people who are stationed on the computer or by their phones, and then we just update like that. Um, because uh, we've tried to have our reporters directly tweet on the site, and when uh, at certain spots, especially when there's so many people fighting for uh, uh, a connection, the Twitter uh, Twitter app just doesn't even open. But thankfully, WhatsApp does, so that's how we've been doing it. Okay, and since you're the um, web editor over there at the Young Post, I wanted to get your um, thoughts on how do you handle all this social media information. I mean, there are a lot of rumors, a lot of facts out there, but you actually need to figure this out and publish it onto your, your tweet, Twitter accounts. Well, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's something that our reporters out there, they're, you know, they're witnessing themselves and whatever, then we just we directly put it up. You know, we trust our reporters. They know what they're doing. They know, you know, how to, f you know, separate facts and rumors. You know, they, you know, they're not going to send us something without checking. You know, it's just the same thing that goes for print. You know, you always have to check your sources. And then sometimes, you know, we're always on social media. We're checking what other people say too. And if something that we doubt, we kind of, we maybe wait a little bit uh, longer to see if somebody else says it. You know, we, I mean, it's, it's, of course, on social media, it's better to be fast, but at the same time, we want to be accurate, too, so. 
Okay. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, we have um, Eric Matt. He's a producer presenter with Radio Television Hong Kong. And um, we have Zoe Hung. She is with the Hong Kong Journalists Association. And we have Leon Lee, who is the web editor at the Young Post with the South China Morning Post. Now, I wanted to ask all of you, um, uh, in, the, in almost a month now, we've had these protests going on, and we've seen a lot of international media flying in to cover these events. And they may be rather new to Hong Kong and don't know much about the situation. Has that changed the way local media covers things? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. We see we see a lot of uh, famous um, photographer and journalists come to Hong Kong. We welcome them, and but we have our own way of uh, doing uh, our local news. And at least we understand the languages. And we have a connection with um, not so famous people. So so uh, when the um, foreign reporter will have better contact with the leaders, uh, the movement leaders, and we will uh, continue our our coverage of the ordinary people. And we have small story and good story of the demonstrator, the local common nobody demonstrator. Well, and be special about this uh, movement. I mean, in this case, with many, many foreign reporters exist, in different sports, I mean, different zones of conflicts, I mean, well, the police and the normal situation, they will provide, they will be more cooperative than they usually are in other protests in Hong Kong, those local protests, I mean, because, uh, the, you know, the international media, they will re report things to the police if they, I mean, they will report things to the world. If the police are treating them bad, they will report this to the world. So in normal cases, well, the p police tend to be more cooperative with the media. They allow the media to be around in different zones. I mean, even when when uh, vigorous actions are not taking part, they will allow the, the reporters to enter the zones of the police to go around. Even the police are wearing those uh, gear on, but we can walk around and we are filming them under normal situations. Yeah, I mean, they provide more convenience in this case when, well, I think that's the good point about the existence of international reporters. But I think uh, the police, uh, the strategy of the police, or maybe do, they are doing the action in a very uh, short preparation. This time, I didn't see cordon line that that you know a cordon line that um, a reporter cannot a enter into this. So I, we see that reporters just stand behind the the police to film uh, the situation. It is uh, it is uh, it has never been happened in this kind of um, large scale uh, demonstration. It is very rare. But I don't think it, they they do that for the foreign press. I don't think so. Leon, um, I, I think uh, Zoe made a good point about you know us being able to speak the language compared to you know the foreign reporters. I mean, because what we did, uh, we also focused. We we basically we've noticed that when our reporters go down there, they they interview the protesters, and there's a lot of little stories. And what we did was we actually uh, put together a gallery, like you know, humans of New York. We did humans of Occupy Central, and we basically trying to display these stories from both sides. You know, you know the. The, you know, people against it, people, people who are for it, or just normal people being affected by Occupy Central. And I feel like, you know, because we, this, we were able, to, again, we were able to uh, provide the more local feel to, you know, the, to this the event that maybe for for me that would not be, you know, as likely to cover. But I think for the protester, the um, foreign press means a lot because we see, uh, we see our story in New York Times and BBC and all. All uh, major station and even talk shows. So we have um, we have forward all kinds of this piece and um, clips um, from the uh, foreign press. We like that, and uh, local people love this story, and they think that you guys uh, 
understand what's happening here. You guys cared about us. So we're very happy and very grateful for that. So what do you think might be missing in the um, international media coverage? What don't they, wh what's not there yet? Let me say, what, what's in there is very encouraging, especially some um, gossip or some information from uh, the, you know, the Beijing source, because uh, some of the sources would only go to the foreign press. That's very impressive and very useful for us, although we cannot uh, check whether it's true or not, but um, it's very useful. Okay, I wanted to ask you about um, alternate story angles. Um, there have been persistent rumors of triad involvement in the protests. Um, I guess particularly like mob men, ma mob men with <laughs> mobs of mass men carrying down barricades, attacking pro-democracy protesters. Has anyone maybe in your news organization really investigated to figure out how far triad involvement gets? Um, I can say that Young Post hasn't because, you know, we, we don't have those contacts. You know, we're a secondary uh, school student uh, newspaper. We don't have any, we don't have that contact, so we haven't, I say that. We see that very good coverage of the Apple Daily because um, <laughs> They have um, uh, taken photos of the uh, uh, people who heeded the uh, uh, pro-democratic um, protesters and the people using violence outside the Abu Dhabi complex and in the Mong Kok and um, mainly these two, this two location. And they have the picture of these um, leaders of violence and then they have these pictures to some helpful triad members. And some of the this kind of leader was recognized. So uh, the Apple Daily have the picture, the names, and the, the unit they were working. So, um, so it is a proof that some triad member is working in the scene. Now, what about the rumors that um, they, the triads have ties with the government. Is there anything out there, a smoking gun, that would prove these rumors? I think it's difficult to get evidence out there. I mean, they won't let you see, at least, they, if they let you see this, I think this will appear in every headline of <laughs> I mean, internationally. I mean, so, I mean, it's difficult to prove with uh, um, tangible evidence, but I mean, at least they are in action or sometimes omission to act may tell that their strategies, they may not be cooperating, but at least their strategies may encourage such, such acts or their strategies or their arrangements may encourage these activities. I mean, this has to be, I mean, this what what we see. Okay, for those of you who are just joining us, we have um, Eric Mack, who is a producer presenter with radio television in Hong Kong. We also have Leon Lee. He is the web editor at the Young Post with um, South China Morning Post. And we also have Zoe Hung, who's on the executive committee with the Hong Kong Journalists Association here. Now, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, we have been covering the protest for quite a while now. What do you think you could have done differently or done better in this situation? I think for uh, for Young Post, I mean, I think we could have come up with a better plan uh, to, you know, when to, what, when to send people out, when not to send people out. But at the same time, I mean, I mean uh, about two Fridays ago, we decided to kind of uh, scale back because, you know, we were pushing our reporters to the max, you know. And in addition, like you said, mentioned before, we don't normally do this, uh, you know, live reporting and stuff like that. So we were kind of pushing our reporters to the max, while at the same time, we, we still have to maintain our print product. So I think if we kind of knew before, you know, uh, I came up with a better strategy of, you know, when to send people out and when to keep, uh, keep them in the office, it would have been a little bit better. 
I mean, I think right now we're still kind of struggling, but at the same time, it's this event. It's you know, it it changes so quickly. We never know when something would happen. But yeah, I think yeah. Well, for RTSK, I mean, actually, I mean, for the local prices, I think it's for most local prices a completely new experience, because, f for example, for us, the TV division of the RTSK, I mean, we have never experienced such things that we of different sections, even from the ETV, they work together with this news, this breaking news. Day. Even the ETV staff, they become the breaking news member. They have to help with the around-the-clock shifts, uh, going out to film things. I mean, this is a totally new ex experience. I think we, we are, we are. It is not. We we cannot have time to review the whole things yet because it's still ongoing and yeah we, we can only think oh, how to get more resources to cover things because things are still go ongoing and well people are yeah many people are having not having day offs already for many days yeah so okay guys so um, any predictions on how the Occupy movement will end? I mean, I think like, like like Eric said, um, it's based, it's unpredictable. We don't know what's happening. So I mean, but like I said, hopefully it ends peacefully. I mean, there's going to be talks next week, so hopefully some good will come out of that. But it's so hard to predict what's going to happen. Yeah, and I I think um, in this incident, um, I think we have to concern another thing is the uh, press freedom, especially we see that in the. Um, in the uh, Apple Daily, what happened to the Apple Daily? Because demonstrator, the uh, the demonstrator who is um, against the uh, Occupy movement, they try to block the distribution of the uh, Apple Daily. So the reporters had been exhausted working outside and you know trying to meet the deadlines, and then they rush back to the to the Apple Daily complex. To form a to be a security guard of the newspaper to let the newspaper out for distribution. I think Hong Kong reporter has been stretched to uh, as Leon said to a to a max, and um, we're trying our best. And we see that reporters became unsatisfied with their superior if there are some kind of cutback or or limitation or or censorship to the uh, to to what they see and what they write so um, I think the situation is really testing our um, our spirit as journalists to how to cover and how to see what is happening and how to report uh, as we see that's very important I think some piece of news that cannot be published in the in the media, the reporter tried to do it in the in the social media. We see that a lot. So um, I expected a um, different phrase of doing journalists is maybe um, coming in the one or two months. Okay, so it sounds like um, the journalist is going to grow from this experience, and so is Hong Kong as well. So, um, Zoe, Leon, Eric, thank you very much for your time. Stay safe while you're out there covering the protests. And um, everyone back home, thank you very much for joining us. You can watch um, our Occupy Hong Kong discussion again and share it with your friends. Uh, the video will be on the aaja.org backslash Occupy Dash Hong Kong page. And um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Are we on?